Um, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to the presentation. Today I'm going to talk about fine grained policies are back with OpenFGA. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, I'm not a native, right? So what I actually meant is that fine grained policies are back with OpenFGA. But before talking about this, let me introduce myself. I am Jose Carlos Chavez. Um, I am an open source enthusiast for more than 10 years. Um, I am also participating in the Coraza WAF project and the OpenFGA contributor. Um, let's start by defining or looking at what is access control, right? Access control, according to Microsoft, determines who is allowed to access certain data, apps, and resources, right? And in what circumstances. Um, and this is pretty much familiar for most of you, right? Uh, nowadays, everything is about security, access, and defense, and all that. So I guess you all know what is the status quo for, for, for this. Um, and the state of art, uh, we have various mechanisms for access control, right? Um, we have discretionary access control. Mainly we have every object has an owner, and then that owner is the one who grants access to, to their specific resource to, to other users, right? Um, we also have mandatory access control, very popular in um, super, ultra, non-plus security things like government stuff or confidential stuff where users are granted access in a form of clearance, right? There is a central authority which says like, uh, which regulates the access and then you have security levels which are rigid. Um, we have also the, the well-known role-based access control right where, where access rights are given in a form of a role right a, a business um, um, business functions so then you have a role that describes what access you have rather than based on individual entity so for the role basically i grant you access for a role but i don't know who you are and i actually don't care i just give access to the role it's an abstraction of your capabilities and then we have the abac right attribute to basis access control which access is granted flexibly based on attributes. You can think of attributes, uh, for example, when you look at your passport, right? But you have certain characteristics. And I grant you access based on those characteristics. For example, when you are about to enter a country, then you have certain characteristics like na your nationality, your age, yeah, your date of birth. Those attributes will grant you access to the country. There are other uh, attributes like, does this person has a visa or not? Is the visa valid? Like all these um, attributes conform the decision for access, right? And there are also environmental conditions, right? Let's say that the, the country is in a war or there are um, certain restrictions about who can enter into the country or not based on political situation, right? These kind of things are, are, are where ABAC basically works good. And we'll also have um, protocols and implementations, right? Which uh, already solve this problem. We have OAuth 2. I guess you all know about that. You have OpenID Connect. You have the JOT, Scopes. If you want more security, you have um, this, the encrypted, the encrypted uh, uh, JSON web token. You have this, the signed one if you, in case you need more and more security, right? So. Pretty much this is all well known to you. So the problem is already solved. Why are we talking about this now, right? Why do we care? Is it solved yet, honestly? Like um, in the last OWASP Top 10 from 2021, we saw how uh, this so-called BOLA, but it's actually called Broken Access Control, went up from position five to position one, right? As the, as the most important security risk in web applications. And in 2023, the OWASP top 10 for APIs, uh, three out of the five first security risks are about authorization. Um, so is actually this problem solved or is it something that we are um, working on? We are exploring the situation or we are getting to know what the problems are, right? To me, it feels like authorization is in the point or at the stage where authentication was some years ago, right? Because you have that the state meets reality. For example, for discretionary access control, um, as I told you, there is, every object has an owner and then the owner grant, uh, grant access to users, which means that it's case by case. It's very ad hoc, right? And it's not scalable. 
um, in mandatory access control. This is very rigid, as I said, right? So it works on static or rigid environments like government, for example, but that doesn't work in a company, and not even in a company that does microservices where every team will are, is independent and will um, scale their services or will split their services, or will define their boundaries in the way uh, it makes sense for them, right? Um, Role-based access control. Um, it's all about the roles, not about the identity. So whenever you need to give more granularity to your access, then you need to create another role. And then if there is another capability you want for, for that person, you create a, yet another role and so on, right? So you, you end up in role explosion. So it's really, it's easy to, to understand and alter policies, but it's hard to scale. Um, in attribute-based access control, you have the, the, the opposite problem, because it's hard to understand, because you don't know beforehand what are the, the attributes that a certain entity might have, right? You just create attributes and there is, um, there is not, an, um, um, let's say, evident connection between them or how they relate or what attribute grants you what, right? There are just attributes that someone defined at some point. So it's hard to understand and model and, auto, uh, and create the policies. Um, but then it's easy to scale and model because you just create a new, you need something else, create a new attribute. Something else, create a new attribute, right? And then we also have problems in the protocol and implementation, right? This is when shift left, left is done wrong because each service does its own authorization. Um, and this is where you ask yourself, like, if I am in a distributed uh, architecture, does every service uh, do its own login? No, that's not true, right? Why do you do that for authorization? And you might be arguing, yeah, authorization, you have different capabilities, you have different requirements, so it makes sense that each one, that's its own, but how do they play together in the big picture, right? That's problematic. Then you have coarse-grained uh, roles, bake it into apps, right? Where it's not the same, like, I give you access to documents, Okay, I give you access to documents, but what about these confidential documents? Or what about this specific confidential document? Can I like um, narrow down the scope of your access? Probably not, because um, it, it will be really messy, right? Because for instance, uh, or just as an example, you might need to know the individuals and that's usually tied to a persistent that you don't know anything about. Um, you also have a spaghetti code everywhere in authorization, right? You remember, I guess you all face as this function is admin. If user ID is equal to one, because uh, whenever you launch the service, one is the, the, the administrator user, uh, and then you, you make assertions based on that. Um, that's also something that I saw many times when it comes to authorization. Then you have the all out the scopes, right? Which you might think, yeah, that's something like, you know, it's industry standard, something that, that has been truly um, well thought. But there are problems with the scopes. Uh, first of all, it's something that you um, emitted on the past, right? It's a grant that you gave on the past. It's not something that happens now. It doesn't represent the current reality. Second is that you grant um, access to, to functionalities, but not to individuals, right? You cannot grant a scope for a specific user, for a specific document, or for a user, yes, but for a specific resource, you cannot, right? There is no scope for that unless you create a new one. And then guess what? We are in the role explosion thing. Um, also, there is no way to invalidate a token, right? Because it's something that was emitted in the past that has a duration, and then you're not evaluating every time. Right. And if you do that, then you will have performance issues because you will have an added, added latency for that. So um, it's something that maybe worked in the past when we were in that crazy about security when we didn't have these kind of problems. Um, also when microservices wasn't that well thought, um, but that doesn't work anymore. And then we have missing or inconsistent audit and authorization logs, right? Which nowadays is, um, let's say in the past, um, we were okay having audit logs and just for compliance, um, it wasn't that we were looking into logs or processing logs or doing post facto processing of the logs and then making conclusions out of it and then taking action on that. That's something that uh, was brought by observability. So all the, the, the previous attempts don't consider this. They are not actionable. They are not something that you, it's not something that you are converting into information, right? So that's, that's another problem. Um, yeah, that's one way to, to look at it, but what is the other way, right? 
Well, um, I don't know if you have heard about Rebac. Um, it's been popular, popularized by Google in 2019 um, by the, the paper called Zanzibar, right? Where it explains um, how they scale access control to Google Docs, Google, um, well, Google Drive, YouTube, Google Cloud, and all that. Um, it provides high flexibility and it's designed to express uh, really complex policies. Mm, it it focuses mainly on relationships, not not necessarily on the entities. Entities are a consequence or, or ancillary to to relationships. Um, it defines the permission basis on relationships uh, and uh, between entities, right? An entity could be a user, can be a team, can be a blob, right? If you want to access a blob, can be a cluster, can be a Kubernetes namespace, can be anything, whatever you can model. Uh, and whatever someone is requesting access to, right? And it's dynamic and context aware, right? Because there are environmental conditions that come into play. For example, I want to grant access to this person, to this resource for 24 hours. And I, or I want to grant access to this person because there is a compliance regulation and only when they are in the, in the, in the US and not in the EU, right? All these kind of things are first class citizen um, of the use cases of, about authorization, right? Not just mere details. Um, so yeah, for example, in this um, in this graph, you can see that uh, we create a model for for um, employees or, or um, team members to be able to allow specific documents, right? We have Alice and Bob. Alice is part of engineering. Bob is part of HR. They are part of company. And then we have that HR is the owner of the HR docs. And then uh, somehow we want that HR people can access to all the contracts, uh, uh, but Alice can only access its, con its contract, right? That's the way you, you express these kind of models. Um, and then we now that we kind of know what is Rebac, we, we are wondering, okay, but what is the implementation, right? What, where can I use Rebac or how can I use Rebac? Well, this is where uh, OpenFGA comes into play, right? I, I like to call it an authorization system for everyone because I think it's truly for everyone, like not a, for every stakeholders in, in the system, right? That has something to say about authorization. It's, uh, it's, it's based on Rebac, as I told you. It's an evolution of uh, RBAC and ABAC. Uh, it's inspired by the paper Google Zanzibar. It was written from the scratch by Okta. Now it's in incubation um, on CNCF. It's built to scale. Um, well, someone is building something. Um, it can scale to millions of globally distributed users and billions of resources. As I told you, it's, it was designed to fulfill the, the, the needs of Google Drive and Google Cloud and YouTube. And it's people friendly. It, it can enable user collaboration and fine-grained access control in your applications. Um, first of all, providing um, developer-friendly APIs, but also um, people-friendly readable models, right? Because um, who dictates the, the authorization policies? Is it the developer? Is it the security team? Is it ProcSec? Is it security engineering? Who does that? And um, how can we put in a way that everyone can understand it and can, um, um, let's say, analyze it and give feedback about it and then implement it, right? We need a common way to do this. If we only focus on developer, this is not going to succeed. If we only focus on product people, Developers might have their own interpretation of this, so we need something um, that, that provides consistent access control across different uh, stages in the design. And let's quickly have a look at, uh, for example, how the previous graph will look like in something like OpenFGA. Well, um, I um, took the time to create this model. Um, you can see that this representation can be easily put up in the model of OpenFGA, which by the way has its own DSL. And it's easy to express because you have a type that is a user, you have a team um, with a relationship, member, right? A user is member of a team. And then you have their entries, right? Um, you could have directories or files, but, you know, I, I come from Golan, so there we call their entries. And then we decide whether it's a directory or a file. 
And a dear entry could have an owner, which is a team, could have a parent, right? And then you can have the relationship of, can I view this? Can a user view this directory? Can a team member view this directory? And we say like, okay, a user can view this, dire well, this directory, um, or if it's the owner, it can also view the, the directory, or if it's a member of the owner, it can also view the, the directory, or if it can view for the parent, right? This kind of reasonable policies about how can someone access um, a directory. Then we have the tuples, which is like the relationships. Um, we see that um, the user Alice is member of the team engineering, the user Bob is member of the team HR, then we have like the the contracts is the parent of the contract of Alice, right, in, in the file system structure. Um, contracts is the parent of the contract of Bob, and then the HR docs is the parent of contracts, you know. All this is something that we can read and we can put in a model. And then I can run the test because it also allows you to run tests to make sure that everything works all right. We can say Alice can only watch her own contract. Well, the user Alex, the user Alice can um, can uh, can view the direct the contract Alice. True, the user Alice can view the contract of Bob. False, right? And then you can run the test. And it says that all are passing, right? HR can only view all the contracts. Contracts and HR docs, dears are part of contracts, right? You can see that we created a model that is comprehensive, that anyone can read, that developers can, can um, understand, people of product can understand, security people can understand, operators can understand, and um, then that we can enforce through an SDK. Right? Back to the slides. What are the cloud native authorization requirements nowadays, right? Which changed over the years. Well, first you need to support a consistent model that address fine-grained access requirements, right? Because now more than any um, than before, we need fine-grained access requirements. I was reading this report that was saying that 80% uh, of the permissions granted to users was over-provisioning. They don't need it, right? But they still have access because. <laughs> It's easy to give you a role that has access for most of the things you need, rather than create a new role. Um, policies should be a first-class citizen and not an application detail, right, as in the past. Um, there should be, a, a, in the secure by design, um, let's say, approach, um, policies are a crucial part of your security posture, right? And they should be treated as, as first-class citizen, meaning that they have their only um, software development life cycle, they have a source of truth that is consistent, that is compressive, that uh, you can validate against, um, and something that has traceability, right? Whenever you edit it and when you build it, and it should be iterative and all that. Authorization checks should be a local call, embracing real-time access decisions. This is very important, as opposite as JOTS, where the access decision was made before and, and the access information or the grants were made some time ago, we need real-time um, access decisions now, right? So every time there is an access request, you should do a call which should be local. Um, but policies and um, subjects, resources, relationship data should be centrally managed, right? So in the end, this, is, this becomes a distributed system problem, right? Where um, the source of truth is central, but the, the decision call is local. Um, decisions and audit logs should be aggregated and stored centrally with consistent format in, um, and, and in a way that you can process them all without caring about where it came from. And access decision must be easy to audit and explain. This is very important because nowadays we need to, um, or we have the means to process all access decisions and all audit logs and then come back with information or come back with um, actions to take, right? Um, and this is how we do right, shift, left. Well, first, models should follow the reality, not the other way around. It's not that I design my application, so, uh, or it's not that I, I um, make my model fit my application, but the other way around. I make my application fit my model, right? And the model should be ubiquitous. Like, should be something that exists in the reality. I just put in the model. That's why we call it model. And then the application plays with that. 
now that I need to model my permissions and my grants so I can make it easy implementation in my model or in my application, right? Um, the coupling policies from the application code and using a standard DSL enables a central management and then it enables also a software development lifecycle fashion for these policies, right? For example, like in, in a GitOps um, approach where we create a policy, um, we store in a central place, um, we can check the changes, we can easily track down who did what changes, we can understand the impact we have before we put the policy in place, right? All these practices that we do for software development, we can do for policies. Also, it's something that is um, of wide audience, so any developer can go and question what is happening, right? Why is this policy in place? Who is this policy affecting um, in, in the system and all that? Yeah, and the transparency of the software development lifecycle provides audit trails, right, on policy changes. Like whenever someone changes a policy and it has an impact, we can see what was the change, what was the reasoning, and, and all that. Um, we have a central source of truth for policies that guarantees consistency and conformance validation across the system, right? So whenever, for example, you create a pull request for a policy, then that policy will go through certain checks, making sure that First, uh, um, it has a, uh, the right format before you put into the, let's say, in, in, in practice. Second, that it follows a schema, that it follows policies that you might have, might have internally. Um, you can even analyze if one policy invalidates another or shortcome another one, right? Because imagine you grant, you grant a certain access to one directory, but then with another policy, you, you basically run access to, to the child, right, which is supposed to be confidential. This kind of thing can be checked statically um, before persisting this into the central source of truth. And enforcement is now possible beyond the application layer. This is very important because if we talk about zero trust and um, where I might be thinking or, I, or where I design policies um, as if the attacker is already inside the network, I need to be able to um, roll out wide policies without the need to care whether every single application puts that in practice, right? Or if every single application onboarded the code that um, checked these policies. So for example, if we think, uh, um, if we think about service mesh, um, am I able to roll out policies at sidecar level or a network level that enforce these policies, right? This is, this is a very important step up in, um, in, in, in access control. Uh, and there it comes on limited possibilities. If you can model it, you can enforce it, right? You can have secure access for user to API, to an endpoint, to a method, to a host, to an individual um, resource in a, in a REST API, for example. Um, you can um, secure access user to user communication, you can secure access user to resource communication, service to service, namespace to namespace if we're in Kubernetes, namespace to cluster. Um, if, you have the, if you have the concept of tires, imagine, like you want to make sure that only tire one can talk to tire two, but tire two cannot talk to tire one. How do you do that? Well, you model it and then you enforce the policy. Um, um, environment to environment, production to test, for example, test can talk to production because I want to test something with production data, but production cannot talk to test, right, because it's production. Um, cluster to cluster, cloud to cloud, whatever you can model it, you can enforce it. That's the good thing about this. Is integration, um, we have, OpenFGA has lots of SDKs um, for different languages, and they are like they have a really good uh, user experience, developer experience, mm -hmm. but also you can hook to ingress gateway integration, like for example, OpenFGA Envoy, right? Or in a sidecar because um, for example, Istio uses Envoy a sidecar. So you can use that, in, that um, integration as well. Um, auditability and forensic analysis, um, you can inspect the consistent logs that you are producing and then um, audit the access decisions, right? And observability and controllability, because you can process the logs and take actions, right? Um, 
you can, with all the audit logs that are produced, you can aggregate them, you can process them, and then you can make actions out of it. For example, um, you can, uh, if you detect an access request that, uh, that is denied, but is so uh, frequent, uh, it smells weird, right? That shouldn't happen unless someone is trying to tag you. Or imagine you have um, the logs, or you have the relationship between two entities, and that means that um, subject has access to, to, to a resource, but then you, you haven't had any um, audit log that checked that there was, or this access was performed over the last six months. Does it make sense that you still have this access relationship or should you clean it up, right? These kind of things you can just do by observing the logs, processing them, and make, take actions out of it, which is the whole um, thing about observability. So, some conclusions, if the screwdriver doesn't, or let me. Um, Rebac is a natural fit for uh, the class of cloud native applications, right? Whose design is based on microservices, independent services with, different, with um, very specific um, concepts and, and use cases. Uh, because it's very flexible and because it empowers every stakeholder and microservices is all about ownership and independence. And then you have several stakeholders and every stakeholder um, can um, understand and contribute to the policies. That's important. Um, being able to understand an access decision in a human way, in a readable way, is crucial to understand access leaks and secure points and forensic research. Um, Performance is a key in access decisions, right? As they are going to be in the critical path. They are going to be analyzed every time, right? So you have to put a lot of effort in um, improving performance on this because if you, like security might play with user experience, right? And, and then if you add, you have a huge latency added or or um, not even a huge latency added, but the unavailability of the central system that makes the decision. That's problematic. So you also have to pay attention about security. This is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you can reach me in any of these uh, links. And I recommend these readings if you want to know more about Authorization, OpenFGA, um, fine grained access control. And yeah, if you have questions, I am in. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, is there any mic? I... No. Um, I think if you have uh, things like, uh, or, or, or this, um, let's say policies where they are mainly um, RBAC, like where you have well-defined roles um, and they are not moving anywhere or they barely change, um, yeah, that doesn't make sense that you evaluate every time the access decision, right? These kind of things, uh, you can, by the way, you can still do RBAC with RBAC. Um, it's fairly easy because in the end you have the the relationship between the role and the user. But if you don't, if you really don't, if you don't really need fine grinded access, like Rebag might be over engineering. So, um, for example, uh, the current API of Kubernetes, um, if it's mainly controlled by, by RBAC, right? Um, and for a standard user, you might be be okay with that. Then continue using RBAC. But if you need more fine-grained control, like you, you want to target specific namespaces, uh, or because of a lack of policies in Kubernetes, um, you want to target specific resources, then you can use Rebac. Um, but it, it's, it's, I mean, RBAC is, it has a still value. ABAC is still has value. Um, it depends on the scale, I would say. Any, see, yeah. Yeah. We're talking about uh, resumes. Let's say you put all those resumes in files or CVs. Okay, you still have to speak to a user. How do you bridge that? Yeah. yeah. 
So there, the, first of all, there, um, there are more and more integration with OpenFGA. Uh, for example, um, before uh, in Grafana, for example, Grafana is a system of logs. And you might be thinking that logs are fine if anyone can access them, but that's not the truth. So they are developing an integration with OpenFGA to give fine-grained access to observability data. Um, someone was requesting the other day uh, um, um, OpenFGA integration with uh, OpenSearch because you want to access you want to restrict access to certain indexes or you know, and then we must build an integration on that. There are two approaches. You can either put a proxy in front and kind of guess or, or do a best effort to to give fine-grained access, but imagine a search, right? You, there's not much you can do with a search. So um, there are more and more um, adoption of, of OpenFGA with more and more in uh, integrations. But of course, um, if you truly want like have a first-class integration, uh, that should there should be a collaboration between the project and, and OpenFGA. Um, in the meantime, you can do proxy, for example. That's one way, but uh, it has some 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 issues. Let's say it's not uh, something you can apply everywhere. Uh, sure. In your last slide, you mentioned also focus on the compulsory implementation. Do you have any uh, thoughts on this? You see both because I'm really interested. Do you have implemented OPA? Uh, yeah. So yeah, I had this slide because in case someone asks about it, um, I I, I played with OPA. Um, for for some time, um, an OPA is good for for writing access policies if you are an OPA expert or if you are well skilled in OPA, um, because it's mainly um, designed for developers. Uh, I don't see a way to integrate these in the, for example, the, the product process. It's really hard to get because it's it's mainly code, right? Um, there is also lack of administrative tooling, right? where you can align policies with business requirements because there is no UI uh, or there is no uh, like a comprehensive way where you can say this is going to ha this is going to do that right because policies are evaluating as code Why you <laughs> yeah yeah that that could happen um and there are also difficulties on keeping track of which policies exist and which rules they contain right that that are the main problems with opa um i'm not saying opa is bad at all uh, it's just um, whenever you want to have an holistic policy system, then OpenFGA have these advantages because it was designed in that way, right? So, yeah. Thank you, because you, you made world my slide. It was a hidden slide at the end. <laughs> uh, any other question? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, I, I will do that right after the, the talk. So, thank you everybody.